before you. Uh, the proposal before you is is to construct a building at 1355 Milltown Avenue, the Northford Triangle property, and connect it to the sanitary sewers in Route 17 that were constructed when they served Stanley T. Williams, uh, the, the school property. Uh, they left the stub that goes to the uh, property at 1355 Middletown Avenue, and the developers of a proposed building on the property would like to connect the new building and the new building alone into the sanitary sewers. Uh, there's no proposal at this time to connect the existing buildings into the sanitary sewers, only the new building. Um, there's the uh, preliminary sketch of the proposed layout of the sanitary sewer on the property included in the package. Um, the primary thing before this board is uh, looking to approve the connection and approve the amount of the special connection fee for the proposed building to connect the sanitary sewers. The um, Connection fee is determined based upon the use of the, the building and, and the size of the building. Um, they're proposing to connect about 2,900 square feet of commercial floor area on the first floor and six apartment units on the second, uh, on the second and third units, uh, which will be constructed uh, as part of the building construction. Um, the, the resultant special connection fee based upon uh, three units for the, for the 2,900 square feet of commercial property. That's about that's $12,000, and each residential unit is is pays a special connection rate of $12,300 per unit for the six units. The net special connection fee for the property is $85,800. Uh, uh, there's a suggested motion before you. Um, and, and basically, this is a developer that has a development rights to the property and the property owner. They, they both have to enter into the agreement for the suggested motion authorizing the connection and the payment of the fees. I've referred this to the town attorney's office. Um, he's edited it. He, he put the wording in regarding the, uh, the suggested motion regarding the property owner and the developer rights. He also put in a, uh, a, he added the provision that they waive the rights to a public hearing and appeal in accordance with section CGS 7-255. He thought that was appropriate to include it in there, and that's his, his suggested addition, and it's been added to the suggested motion. Um, that's pretty much it. Again, it, it's, it will give approval for that property that will connect to the sanitary sewers. They still got to go through the planning and zoning process. Uh, that's the next step. But this, this is really a first step along the way. And again, the important thing is the other buildings on the property, there's the ability to connect to the sanitary sewers, but they have to come back, requ request permission from the WPCA to connect and pay a subsequent special connection fee at that time. Kurt, any idea what the commercial side of that will be? No, I don't. That'll be through planning and zoning. I, I, I believe it's retail, but I'm not sure at this point. It, again, that'll be before planning and zoning. It, they'll I'm show just it saying, if a restaurant or something went in there, you know, what? How, is, a, our, how is the sewer usage based on a meter? Uh, they would be based upon the water consumption because they would be connected to public water. Okay. Right. Kurt, the special connection fees that we collect, yep. does that go towards capital? It goes towards the capital fund, paying for things like pump replacements, building maintenance repairs, that type of operation. If, if there was a problem with a sanitary sewer line and we had to make a capital repair to the sewer, it would go towards that. We've is used them, the, the biggest, we've used the, the capital money in the past towards pump station upgrades because that's that's our biggest expense okay does it go for capital expense to other towns um, capital like that we go into whether it's North Haven or Brantford or, or is it all just New Haven greater New Haven well we WPC for all the, for all those I mean, over the years it's helped pay for the uh, upgrades to the Brantford sewage treatment plant and the North Haven treatment plant 
but those are both two big expenses that the supplemental fees that were collected from the special connections and supplemental sewer assessments were utilized to pay for those. Okay. Yep. Is this building uh, in it? Well, is there any restrictions in that um, in that uh, triangle for building uh, for building codes as far as um, height, size, width? And if so, or does do you, do you know if this falls into that? Well, height is 35 feet is is, is the allowable. Um, that, but it goes through the planning zoning process. Everything will be verified in terms of um, the proposed. You know, the, are, are those are the I'm just asking are the, are, are the current structures there are those three uh, three floors not necessarily I think some of them are two this is three right this is three and when they go it's got to go through plan zoning there's a special use process because when they want to do the uh, apartment units over it that requires a special the special use that from playing a zoning for that. Okay. Again, there is a suggested motion for reconsideration. Well, I just, I, then I have another question. Oh, sure. If if in fact, which I don't know, it, if it doesn't meet current requirements, if it doesn't, then would we vote on that anyways and see if it passes planning and zoning or, or do we already know it does meet whatever? Planning and zoning can have <coughs> um, special conditions. Again, it's a special use. They could modify it. They, they could deny it potentially. Um, that's a possibility where they can make enough changes. Um, if they made enough changes to, to, if they made changes to the building and the use, then it would have to come back here for a subsequent, because it would be a different, different building at that point. But uh, usually, it, I mean, the first step, plans only can't act until all other body, bodies act on it. Okay. Wetlands, Water Pollution Control Authority, they're the first ones that have to act. Planning zoning is the final body to take any action on it. Okay. Yeah, I think we vote on it and then turn yeah, it over and, to them. Yeah, and again, if something, if it weren't to be passed by plain zoning for some reason or there was a modification, if it weren't to be passed, then it just wouldn't go any further. You know, this, okay. this, this, right. this would I'm, be a meaningless approval that, helps. At that point. I just, just was curious because yeah. I didn't know. Yeah. <clears throat> but do we know, are they, Kurt, do we know, are they asking for any variances or anything to build this building, or is it all falling? They're in? not asking for any variances. I mean, they, they've had preliminary discussions with the planning zoning. I haven't been involved, you know, in, in that part of the process. That was um, done a while back. Um, but again, for the final process, they've got to come and we have to verify everything is compliant. But what they're proposing right now falls in with they don't need it calls in, the, the plan zoning actually Revise the regulations in discussions with the property owner that to make provisions that would allow for the additional um, apartment units in the building. So plan zoning is, is aware of it. They haven't seen the final application. They've seen the concept. But the final application has to comply with plan zoning regulations. Thank you. If my memory is correct, when this project was approved, it was five unit or five building commercial project on that site right is this building and its location and size consistent with that original approval and is the original approval still valid and in force uh, the answer with you, uh, i know because it, yeah there were, you're right there were five buildings this makes a fourth building i believe I'm trying to recall because it's a long time ago too, Joe. Um, there was one. We won't talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> Again, there was. One, you're right. There was one more unit, um, but I haven't checked it for the plan, plan is only compliance at this point. Well, with that approval back, it's got to be at least 20 years ago. Yeah, it's 30 is it still years. Still valid. Ago. 
I don't know. I mean, I don't I mean this assume too. somebody at the zoning office would have checked. And if, yeah. If and that approval, which you say is 30 years old and well maybe, is no longer valid, I mean, this is an intense use. I can't believe they would even entertain the proposal if the original approval no longer stood. Yeah. I'll be honest with you, Joe, I haven't gotten into the whole plane zoning review at this point. It, it was, Carrie Ducas have been working it through the process. Right. So I, I was taking it through this process and then it was going to go back to plane zoning. So I, I can't tell you the full history on that. Well, what I tell you, the reason why I was asking, Kurt, is there's a certain aesthetic view right there in those right right now and I think right. that it's designed to be like that does this match that you know is it yeah. required to match it is, is a question I you know that that's why I was asking the questions yeah I mean and again that would be part of the plan zoning review and, and approval process Guess at the end of the day, we're not doing anything but giving the right to hook up to the yeah, source. Yeah. That, that's it. And hopefully P and Z is going to do their job and make yeah. sure we don't end up with a site that's overdeveloped or inconsistent with whatever was approved twenty or thirty years ago. Yeah. But I do have a little bit of concern. It, it's a pretty congested site. The center of Northwood. Yeah, I mean, again, historically, what I do recall, there was five original buildings to yeah. be on the site. There was an issue with uh, the southerly part of the property because of the well. I think there had to be community wells there. They, they, they couldn't build them at that time. So they only built the, they built the three buildings. Now, they ran into a problem with the state of Connecticut. Right. By having five buildings, they somehow, unbeknownst to them, became a water company. And that stopped them from okay. developing all five buildings. Um, I just have some difficulty believing that that approval from way back when is still valid. Yeah. Plus, in the meantime, Joe, they had, now they have water and sewer there, so it's got to change it a little bit. Yeah, look, if they meet the regulations and it doesn't And it bother, sounds like it sounds like it sounds like they change I'm good. Yeah, it sounds like they changed the regulations to meet it now. Yeah. Probably another text amendment. Is th is this building close or to where they were gonna put the fifth one originally in the plants? I'd be I'd be lying if I told you if I remember exactly where the other buildings were they go. Maybe Joe remembers. I've got memory, but it's <laughs> Well, it looks like something was approved in February of 2007. So is that about what you're thinking? I thought be, it was older than that. Yes. I mean, because there's a, a warranty deed in here that, as part of our package that talks about the Northford Triangle Associates and the devel de developmental rights. Norfolk North, North Triangle was approved by the time I came here in, in 87, thereabouts. Yeah, that sounds right. Well, in order not to waste time, I'll move the motion as, as written in our packet. Second. Okay. Uh, motion was made by Councilor Duty, seconded by Councilor Angeloni. Any further discussion? Can I have a vote, Michelle? Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Abstain? All right, next. Uh, 
next year we uh, Kurt you'll keep an eye on that then, uh, then absolutely we'll, yep okay all right next we have a request uh, to connect proposed building sanitary sewers 1437 Middletown Avenue map 67 D lot 84 all right um, this item actually came before you back in November of uh, 2020 and, and was approved uh, for the proposed additional building at 1437 Middletown Avenue to be connected to sanitary sewers. I, um, I put together the um, required special connection fees based upon the information provided by the, the applicant at that time, which, for, which was for 4,000 square feet of commercial floor area. They only provided a preliminary sketch at the time, but I, I did run it, I put it together, I ran the draft motion by the um, applicant's engineer for any comments as well, and that's what went before you back in November. Subsequently, when um, we had the agreement prepared in accordance with, with the um, approval, um, in talking to the owner, he had, he had a hard time with, he thought the fee was excessive. Which, which was $16,000 based upon the proposed 4,000 square feet of commercial floor area. Um, I looked at what he subsequently submitted with his billing department application for the building, which had more detail and had a better definition of uses. Um, and it, in my opinion, it warranted a relook in, in terms of the, how the special connection fee was calculated. I might have been a little more, a little too aggressive when I came up with the original number using the 4,000 square feet of commercial floor area. Uh, based upon the submitted um, architectural drawings with the building permit application, which are more detailed, I looked at the uses and the square footages of the, of the, of the building. And, and basically there's about 1,900 square feet of garage area on the first floor. And, um, let me hold on one second. About 1,900 square feet of uh, garage area, which really falls more under an industrial usage. I mean, it, it appears to me to be that. I just need your concurrence on that. And about 1,400 square feet of commercial floor office space usage on the second floor. Uh, then that result, that comes down to about two units. Uh, the big difference is the industrial usage versus the uh, commercial usage. One unit for 3,000 square feet for um, industrial usage and one unit for per 1,000 square feet for commercial usage. I mean, the net result, that would increase, uh, decrease the number of units. It's, two connection units with a fee of $8,000. I spelled out and I, I attached um, appropriate sections of our regulations to show you what I, you know, what I was basing it on. And I have a recommended motion for the it's the same motion that was uh, originally approved except for lesser square footage and um, a, less, a lower special connection fee of $8,000. So instead of 16, years. it'll be instead reduced 16, it would by 50%? Yeah, and, and again, the, the big difference is uh, industrial usage, one unit for every 3,000 square feet versus commercial unit, one unit per 1,000 square feet. And a little more detail, there was some wasted space or just attic space in, on the second floor, so that reduced the square footage as well a little bit. But again, the big difference is I have more detailed plan subsequent, you know, when it came in with a billing permit after the WPCA approval. And that's what I went, went off with, with this recent review. Your suggested motion say 60, 16,000? That was the old one. That, um, it's 8,000 $8, dollars. So uh, there's another motion. It's a revi yeah, it's it, it, revised. It's on the second page is the revised motion. I, I the other one with sixteen thousand was the old motion. I included as backup. 
So what's the total? What's the total here? Thirteen ninety-eight versus in nineteen oh six. Thirteen ninety-eight of commercial square footage and nineteen hundred and six square feet of garage slash industrial usage of area. So. And then the industrial usage is one unit for every 3,000 square feet. The commercial unit is one unit for every 1,000 square feet. Okay. It, the net result is two units. Kirk, if you don't mind, can you just give me a quick summary again on why is it being reduced by 50%? Cut in half? When I figured it out originally, I figured uh, everything being commercial usage. 4,000 square feet because it was just square footage is what they gave me. Um, and I put it all as commercial usage. The subsequent plan that went in with the building permit application has garage and garage doors on, on uh, the lower level. The lower level, and I've talked to the applicant, I mean the owner about it, that's just for storage and garage area. So it's a, it's a different use with, with a less, lesser in, in lesser intensity. Are garages always separated out in the commercial operations as being an industrial well, use as opposed to commercial? I, I try to look at what they're try, trying to do. This, and every building is constructed a little different. This is, this is more of an unusual one that like they ran across. A lot of times it's just a commercial use and it's either business, retail, doctor or offices type of thing. This is more a storage area when they have an office space above. That's why there's the different uses in there. And I tried to separate it because it seemed to best describe the use. Usually it's, it's a consistent use, but this is an unusual one. I guess I just want to make sure that it's consistent for all businesses that are coming in. So, um, you know, others who have gone through this. It's, con it's consistent. It, it's similar to what was re recently came before this board for, I think it was 26 Mansfield Drive. They had a similar thing and they had the detail, and it was almost, it was pretty close to the same use. They, they had a split use. They had a garage down below, and they had an office above. But that's, those are probably the only two I've ever seen like that. And they have to both come in pretty close together. But it, se it seemed to best describe the use and account for the, the square footage. I mean, we're not trying to penalize, but I mean, I'm trying to be consistent. You're 100% correct to that. Consistent and, and, and fair, and it is what it is. I'd like to move the motion, uh, the revised suggested motion that's in our packet on page 29 um, of our tablet. And basically it's the same motion except it's reducing the special connection fee down to $8,000 based on the new calculations. Second. I'll second. Joe, that was you? Yeah, it was. Okay. Motion was made by Councilor Angeloni, seconded by Councilor Fornan. Uh, any further discussion? I, I just have one quick, I'm sorry. Go ahead, no, go ahead. Kurt, just one quick question. Yep. On, the <clears throat> on the drawing that shows the lower level, I just want to make sure I'm seeing this right. The, it's an L-shaped building, correct? That's correct. And in the front, it shows two garage doors with a walkthrough in between the two garage doors? That's correct. And then they're also calling the back of the building the garage as well? Yes. There's no garage doors there though? Not, not shown. So how is that a garage? Uh, I'm going by what, what they're labeled it and what their intended use is. I mean, I, it's obvious the front part is a I garage. Mean, the, the way it was described to me is that's where they're going to store materials. So my understanding is they, they bring them in from the main 
paint area, but it's all it's all material being stored. So if it's material storage, it still falls under that same category, yeah. not well, commercial. It falls under uh, that, storage is industrial. Yes, that, that's that's why I, I, I included copies of the definition. Um, no, I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, I just noticed yeah, that. I, 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 I try to be consistent. Industrial use is any use of a structure as a place to manufacture, fabricate, repair, build, package, assemble, store, demolish, okay. process, or transform the quality of state of the thing. But okay, thank you very much. Okay. Okay, I have the motion in the second. Uh, we have a vote, Michelle. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstaining? Thank you. Thanks, Kurt. Uh, next, we have citizen statements and petitions. Mike, do you have or hey, Anthony back here? You guys have anything? Uh, one moment. No comments uh, via email. Okay. Anthony, you're all set? Yep, all set. Okay. Uh, uh, next is... Uh, Mr. Mayor, before we continue on, um, I would like to make a motion to amend the agenda and add item 13E, um, discussion on the Stanley T. Williams roof. What was 13E, Rose? The Stanley T. Williams roof. Okay. Motion was made by Councilor. Any uh, motion was made by Councilor. Is only second by Councilor Form. Any discussion on that? Can we have a vote, Michelle? Bell Baylor. Aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. Next is reports of committees, boards, and commissions. First is Economic De Development Commission Roger Solowey's monthly report. Um, so EDC met last night. Um, I was only there for a portion of the meeting because I had an another meeting. Um, but um, a good part of their meeting was a presentation by the um, Belafonte companies. They are looking to um, put in a luxury apartment complex by the uh, ice rink. Um, so it's in the beginning stages. They have not um, come, you know, they've talked to planning and zoning. They're getting everything together. Um, and I know one of their biggest concerns is um, the special connection fee for sewers because they want to hook up to sewers. So if it moves forward, um, it's, um, I do expect that to come before the council um, on, on that. And um, as we heard earlier, the special connection fees are, are used to pay for capital things. And it's not, I mean, we don't have our own sewer treatment plant here. So we're paying for not only our pumping stations, but for where our sewage goes into, whether it's North Haven, Bramford, Greater New Haven. Um, so it's a critical piece for us because those pay, people that do pay for sewers, that have sewers, if, if we didn't have those fees, um, it would be, those people would be paying a lot of money on, on their sewer bills. Um, so at this point, um, so they're, right now it's proposed for a 120 units, um, but there's a lot of work that has to be done between planning and zoning and, and everything else um, for that area in there. Um, but I uh, do expect it to come forward at some point in time to the council. Okay, thanks, Rose. Uh, next is uh, Parks and Recreation. Um, park and Recreation um, met last week, I guess. Um, a lot of their discussion um, was held in regards to the Poco Fest for this year. Um, they are waiting until their next meeting or well they're they would they're going to decide by may 1st 
um, if the festival will be going forward on there. But um, with all of their major vendors, which is the rides, um, the tent company, uh, the um, fireworks, um, a lot of those, they all have um, agreements that if it's not held this year due to COVID, there's no money out. They, they won't be penalized for anything. So they are um, negotiating all of that with their contractors on there. So with the, you know, with all the vaccines that are now coming out and more people getting vaccinated and numbers going in the right way, they would just like, rather than make the call now, they would just like a little bit more time before they make that call to see what's going to happen with it. What did you say, May 1st? Um, I believe it's May, right? The be so it might be like at their April meeting because it's the end of April um, on there. Um, but they are also talking about um, in the event that they don't hold the Poco Fest for this year is to have other um, special events um, on a smaller scale, kind of deconstructing the Poco Fest and having um, smaller things throughout the summer and into the fall. Um, Jessie and her team have been very proactive in coming up with ideas. They are also, they just kicked off a fundraiser um, where you can buy, they have a limited number of tickets that they're selling and what they're doing to promote uh, restaurants, delis, um, that sort of the restaurants in town um, because they've been affected by COVID is they're raffling off a gift basket of $20, $50 gift certificates to various restaurants, delis, that um, sort of thing in North Brantford. Um, so that's the first prize is $20, $50 gift certificates and there's also a gift certificate that Country Paint and Hardware donated. Um, they've been a very huge supporter of the Poco Fest. So they are um, doing this fundraiser to raise money um, for the Poco Fest on there. Um, and then there is just one other thing that I'm going to direct to the town attorney and I know they may not have an answer tonight but Several months ago, I think it was last year, um, they submitted several things to the town attorney that they're waiting for approval on. Um, language, it has to do, there's three items. The food vendor application. Oh, I have that, sorry. You got, okay. Permanent signs for the park and rec fields. And also a question in regards to um, comments from the public in regards to their minutes. And that was submitted last fall and they're still waiting for some guidance as to how to handle that. So I know you're new, Tim, to this whole thing, but if you can just check in. I will follow up on that tomorrow. Yep, great. Okay. And that's it. That, that's it, thanks Rose. Uh, next, we have Police Commission. Uh, the Police Commission had a special meeting on Thursday, February 18th to approve the, the Police Commission uh, Communications and Capital Budgets. The next regular meeting is Monday, March 8th. Okay, thanks, Marie. Uh, next is Fire Commission. The next meeting is this Thursday night. Okay, next is uh, Board of Education and Town Council Communication Subcommittee. Then no meeting. All right, next we have Town Planning Goals Subcommittee. No meeting. Next is Planning and Zoning Commission. Next meeting's Thursday, uh, March 4th. Okay, uh, next we have uh, North Manford Police Department Facility and Town Center Advisory Committee. The committee's having a special meeting on Monday, March 8th to review vendor presentation and also to have some discussion on budgeted and non-budgeted items. That's this coming Monday. Okay, thanks, Marie. Next, uh, financial uh, subcommittee, finance subcommittee. Um, we 
meet every other month, so our next meeting is in April. Okay. Uh, next we have on here is Jay's ad, ad hoc design review committee. Uh, is that necessary to? Yeah, I think that, that can come off. Yeah. Yeah. That committee's done with, right? Because that was strictly the high school. Yeah. And that moved to permanent projects, so. Mike, you can take that off the next. Sure, and now uh, if we go back to uh, um, F, town planning goals and subcommittee, do you want to keep continue that or should we put that on hiatus as well? Why don't you take that off for now? Take yeah. it off for now, okay. Okay, uh, next is uh, permanent project building committee. <coughs> I think that's kind of a placeholder, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I, I think you've got an appointment tonight, and then I was hoping uh, just, just to say that uh, okay. that'll be added. It is added, and that I'm hoping to, you know, make the calls to get them uh, to an organizational meeting, and uh, working on picking a night that's going to work for them. Okay. Very good. All right. Next is uh, town manager's report update on COVID-19 clinics and homebound. Uh, East Shore District Health Department, I yeah. believe that's budget. Yeah, I kind of threw uh, a lot there in, in, in one category uh, for health related and, and, and the COVID. So you have the report in your packet, which is, uh, you know, I think we mentioned last time the numbers are, 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 are breaking and trending uh, in the right direction. We talked a lot about, Mike went through uh, where the numbers were, you know, November, uh, uh, well, December, uh, you know, really significant numbers that, that climbed and we, we dipped to uh, 25 out of 169 towns. Since then we've rebounded and, and there on the report page three, you see that we're back up to 65 and even this data is, um, is old. So uh, the, the trend I understand is, is still going in our favor uh, with, uh, with the number of cases and, and our positivity rates. So um, things look better. Uh, and so I just, I don't know if there's any questions. There's a lot of, a lot of information in there. And again, it's a, it's a, it's a bit old. Um, I'll be getting uh, additional numbers uh, when we sit down again for our weekly meeting on Thursday morning. Um, I can pass those on uh, if the council is interested to, as, as updated numbers. But as far as I know, the trend is still working in our favor. It's going that way across the country, so it's, it's yep. just following it. Well, we did, I mean, now we're at 65. That's the way you want to go. You want to go to That's, a higher number. So yes, exactly. Compared to 36. And when you look at the other towns, towns around us are, yeah. are we're doing much better than they are. Yeah, it's, it's it's Madison, East Haven, Bramford. Yeah, we're doing much better than them. So, yeah, it's it's almost you know we're opposite. Uh, if you looked at if those numbers, where where Guilford and was at 117, Madison was at 111. Um, so Madison went from 111 to 39, and and uh, Guilford was 117 down to 85, and and East Haven is two. Uh, you know and. Um, Brantford uh, was at 75, went to 23. So it, there's no, uh, you know, it's hard. It's hard to sort the, you know, what's happening in each each community. But this is the one I'm focused on, and and you know, if the numbers for us at this point, knock on wood, it's uh, it, it's working in our favor. Um, you know, and I wanted to just to, again, if there are more questions, that, that I'll be happy to 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 answer. But um, just wanted to combine the numbers here with the fact that uh, we're running and operating the clinics and, and doing the best that we can to move as many people through the, the clinics. Uh, and as you know, the governor uh, put together the, uh, or made the uh, emphasis on, on, on teachers. So there was a large um, uh, clinic today to get um, those vaccinations out. And I know Jessie's here and, and her team has been invaluable uh, in terms of Running these clinics, it, this one moved from Stanley T to the to the high school because of the sheer volume. But I don't know if there was any final number on, on today's. I believe it was 272 or 274. Mm -hmm. I can get the final count on it tomorrow. Yeah. Great. A, a lot of that was school staff. All, 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 yes, teacher staff and and uh, it, do you know how the breakout when we we got 20, 22? 22. 22, 22, yeah. 
So some of those, you know, were a mixture of municipal uh, employees, anyone that, you know, and again, with the category of, of now uh, 55 and, and, and up. So uh, we're working through the list on, on municipal employees that are, that are left and uh, working with the, with the public as well. The library has also uh, stepped in to, to help field calls when the senior center is over, overwhelmed with, with the calls that are coming in there. Um, and we're just, you know, doing the best we can, coordinating with East Shore. Uh, to make sure that we get information out about where the clinics are and, and, and how you can get signed up for them. So, um, one of the interesting things is, is a strategy I added there on, on homebound. So it's particularly uh, um, difficult to try and identify uh, individuals that are homebound uh, and we're working on a strategy uh, to get some messaging on that and um, Louisa Breen Social Services is helping and we're looking, you know, part of the part of the issue is, is just defining homebound. So we're, we're coming up with a definition, but essentially an individual is unable to leave their home without difficulty, and that leaving would require considerable and taxing effort due to illness or injury restricting their ability to leave the home without supportive device such as a wheelchair or use of a special transportation. Leaving the home is medically contradictory. And so, um, it, you know, it's, it's not that you, you may have have given up uh, driving and you can't get out, somebody can come and get you. We're, we're, we're trying to find the, the uh, by definition, the homebound that, uh, that really um, need our help. And uh, I think that the uh, Pfizer um, vaccination can help us as, as, a, as a one shot, one and done. Uh, so we're working through that. I don't have the final uh, plan. East Shore is, is helping assist us with that, but it goes to first to identifying, and we're looking um, to identify homebound by that definition and trying to reach them and coordinate with them and find and put together a strategy and a plan uh, to get to those individuals. And I don't know yet how large that group is, and that's part of the identification process. So. That you're talking about the Johnson and Johnson. Well, I'm thinking, yeah, I, you know, if that comes online, yeah. and, and again, not knowing how long that's going to take, and and when and if we do get it, but it does help if there's only if you only have to administer yeah. one shot rather than have to uh, come back a second time, because uh, we're, we're trying to work out that strategy and how to administer, who's going to do it, who's going to take in, into the home to to do that uh, for those homebound individuals. So it's a. Um, it, it, it's going to need some more work, more strategy. Uh, but anyway, we're, we're, we're working to, uh, you know, to address that issue as well. And then uh, last thing, just on, on um, East Shore District's uh, budget, uh, if, if you prefer to have uh, Mike uh, Pascasilla as, as director come in on the 16th and add him to the 16th, or um, we can add him to one of the other dates, but uh, um, typically, you know, we, 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 I think we've, in the past, reserved some, some time. So if there are no objections, I can put him on the, uh, the 16th uh, meeting and have him present. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. And, and that's it for, uh, for COVID and health-related issues. Okay. All right. Uh, next, we have a review of RFP number 9 R slash RFP. Number six, North Grandford Intermediate School Masonry Project. Yeah, so I, on, on this, I wanted to bring to your attention that it, it came up at, at one, uh, uh, one of the meetings last week or, or previous meetings, not here, but the uh, design review or selection committee, that's where it was, it was in the uh, selection committee meeting uh, that Rose Construction would be interested in on the masonry repair project. Um, it hadn't previously been, been interested, but indicated an interest and asked if the the language of RFP 9 uh, was enough to 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 use. I, I wasn't. Uh, I couldn't recall at the time, so I told Mr. Uh, told Al Rose that uh, that I would review RFP number nine, and, and sure enough, that I, I placed that in your your packet on page um, page five is the particular language um, that I wanted to bring to your attention. Um, as we did, uh, this, and RFP number nine was for the auditorium work that we did last year, and the language and the last paragraph, uh, selected firm or individual may be retained by the owner for services related to phase two at North Brantford Intermediate School for the 2021 construction season. 
rate for continuation of this contract can be negotiated by the town and the firm individual for future needs. Um, so, you know, it raises the, you know, the, the flexibility, the opportunity for the council um, to look at um, the bids that came in. I gave a, a, a copy of uh, the RFPs. There were seven that came in today. Uh, Rose Construction was one of them. Uh, and um, I asked the town attorney uh, and specifically talked with, with, with Tim about reviewing uh, that um, issue to see if um, it does give the, if it's enough in terms of language to give the council flexibility to negotiate with Rose on the auditorium or if you just want to review um, the award and the, and the RFP for the next meeting. Well, well, the problem is, is that it, because he was awarded last year, everyone knows what his rate is, what his rate was on there. So he's at a disadvantage because it was awarded and they all know, and with the language that it, it's, you know, it can be related to the NBIS project on there. I feel that's a disadvantage to Rose, uh, you know, Rose Construction because everyone knows what the bid was well, on there. Any company yep. that does business with the public sector, we're going to know their rates and what they were paid. So any, any company in the state that does public business, we're going to know their rates for other products. No, but we, the way I read this language, and we can have Tim, is that we wouldn't have had to go out to bid because we could have just negotiated with him because he had won the award for last year. And we wouldn't have had to go out to bid for the NBIS project. And, and the other part of that is, I know the proposal here has the hourly rates and what the estimate is, and it's based on 200 hours. Well, the auditorium work, that was the same hourly, you know, estimated hours for the auditorium. and. It was approximately 150 hours that was done for the auditorium. The NBIS project is way larger than the auditorium, and 200 hours is not going to get us the project. I can tell you that right now, based on, and the auditorium was, um, was probably, I think the bid came in to fix the auditorium brickwork was somewhere around $60,000. NBIS is probably going to be over a half a million dollars, at least, based on the original estimate we have, and then there's been other problems identified. So, so the estimate total of work for the NBIS project, I believe, is very understated to what that project is going to cost us. We're not going to get it done for 200 hours from it, anyone. It's probably too understated to even look at RFP number six without making changes to it. So I guess I guess we're left with when and certainly uh, Tim can weigh in, but um, if on the face of it that language is enough to if the council's interested to negotiate directly with uh, Rose construction on the project, I guess it would be the first threshold question. Right, so. That would be my recommendation. Otherwise you have a, a, a flaw in, in RFP number six already, so. Can we do that? Yeah. Yeah. So um, we took a look at, is it okay if I stand? You might yeah, have to please. come up to the mic just so that they can hear it. I'm going to apologize in advance if my mask offends any uh, Giants <laughs> fans here tonight. Uh, we, we took a look at a few a few things. We looked at the contract language, and then we also looked at this, obviously, in the context of the uh, Permanent Project Building Committee, because uh, what has happened is, if I understand the timeline correctly, um, you had a, a bid award to Rose, and then after that bid award, you had an individual affiliated with this company appointed to the PPBC. And so you now have a situation where the PPBC 
might be involved in the review of and approval of uh, continued work under that future needs provision. So um, I had uh, Owen Weaver and my firm uh, conduct an analysis of, of the language um, in not only in the contract but also your ethics code uh, and how on a go forward basis this should be handled in the event that you do elect to proceed with uh, the Rose RFP. If you elect to proceed with the existing contract language and the provision that allows for future needs, I have to advise you that if uh, Rose is used on a go forward basis and it is referred to the PPBC for, or the council elects to refer to the PPBC, uh, Mr. Rose is going to have to recuse himself from all proceedings involving anything that he might be working on that will be reviewed by the committee of which he's a member. Uh, so that's an additional layer of consideration uh, that you're going to have to just go into eyes wide open. Uh, there's going to have to be a disclosure and a recusal. Um, so I just want to state one thing just so everybody's <clears throat> on the same page. The Permanent Project Building Committee right now is not active. It's not, it's not full. So as of right now, there's no uh, issue with that. Um, the second part of that is there's been talk about having Al step down to an alternate position on the Permanent Project Building Committee, which means he would not have a vote. He would just be able to add uh, comment to those meetings. Is that, would he still be able to do that? Can't comment. Okay. You can't, you can't take any type of an affirmative act, even in the absence of a vote, that would suggest uh, participation in something where you might be directly or indirectly involved, uh, involved in, in a personal or professional capacity. So then he'd, he'd have to step down from the permanent project building. He would have to recuse himself from any matter involving yeah. his company that were to come before the PPP. Oh, so he could stay on. He just couldn't have anything to do with these projects. Yeah, anything that he is involved. Anything that his his construction company is involved in. Uh, and and look, he might bid on future work, and he might not get it. And then it's not an issue if he is sitting on the committee and. Uh, casting votes or participating in deliberations involving another vendor or another contractor. But if, if there's a vote on a contract award, if there's a review by the committee on any work that he undertakes, um, he cannot participate in anything related to his company. Can, can an, and this is to, I guess, you guys too that have been around longer than me, could, could, an alternate that, could an alternate then step in and fill his position so that there's a full commission well, if he, or out of a full board or whatever? An alternate, yeah, I mean an alternate only would be a voting member if, if there wasn't, if the five regular members weren't there. Right, or, so but if Al had to... if somebody abstains, you know, or so recuses if, himself. Yeah, because right. if Al recuses himself, then you're left with an even number, which could be... Right, so there could, could be right. an issue. So an alternate could then step into his role for right. that purpose, right? Yeah. That's okay. the general intent of having all the <coughs> boards and commissions. If there's an absence of a member, or if for whatever reason there's a conflict that causes a member to have to recuse themselves, then the alternate steps in. Makes sense. So in other words, Tim, just so I understand this, so an alternate can step in and out of the role throughout the same meeting? Depending upon the, the language for an alternate that's codified in a municipal code or your charter. In the event that, let's say for example, municipal code or charter says there's going to be a committee of five people with two alternates, or three alternates. If you have a five member board and one person is conflicted and they don't have the ability or capacity to have an alternate replace them, to Councilman Pellucci's point, then you would have a 2-2 vote, motion fails. So then having the alternate elevate when that member recuses themselves, it then allows for a deliberative process with the finality, where you could have a 3-2 vote. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So the, um, the, quite the second sentence of this language from RFP 9, where it says rate for continuation of this contract may can be negotiated by the town and the firm or individual for future needs. Is it end that, I guess part of our question is future needs, it's not just the NBIS project, it could be any project that we have in town? 
Well, you see, I, I could make an argument that I could make an argument either way. I, I could okay. make an argument that because the RFP, and I've looked at the RFP, it was, was specific to that specific need, if a future need arises as it relates to that RFP, that project specific RFP, that if future needs arise based upon that project specific RFP, it should be restricted to that project. Although, because it, it says future needs, it doesn't say future needs of the project, somebody could interpret it the well, other Well, because of the first sentence saying that we, the town has the right to negotiate for phase two of the NBIS project. Correct. And then it goes into future projects after that. So, so it could go either way, is what you're saying? Yes, it could. Okay. So, so, so I guess I'll, I'll, I'll throw this out for Tim as well. Sure. Um, I, I guess following that, that line uh, from Councilor Angeloni, if the council was satisfied the track record in, in performance of the auditorium work, wanted to go with Rose Construction, they could actually to do the high school and uh, the PD based on, on that as future, as future needs. I would advise against that. Um, I, I would advise against that, but that's why I think, you know, it, it's it's important that you know the interpretation be such that you can obviously not restrict your right in the future if you want to specifically tailor an RFP for a future use. You, you're able to do that. Did that answer your question? Uh, yeah. Well, uh, yeah. I was just saying if 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 yeah. I thought I thought you'd said earlier it would go either way, and that's why I was thinking. Well, then future needs, if if, because we are going to be looking, the council is going to wrestle with the fact that that uh, a clerk of the works, and essentially this is what this is, where you the semantics, if you call it an owner's mm -hmm. rep or clerk of the works, if you know the track record of a, of a company and and had a successful outcome, and we have language that says they can go to uh, to the NBIS. Uh, and we have future needs in the high school and in uh, the PD, uh, could we engage that firm or that construction company yeah. um, in, in doing and negotiating, not just NBIS, but negotiating with them on capacity and ability to do the high school and the PD. That was that's essentially. This RFP though pertained specifically to the masonry repairs and only reference the North River Intermediate School. Right. Okay. It did not reference in the RFP the police department. Right. Okay. So if it wasn't referenced in the original RFP, again, project specific. But the point I was trying to make was when I said either way it pertained to for MBIS. MBIS. Okay. Well no, actually this language came from the first one which was the auditorium. The language RFP of nine was for uh, the auditorium. Correct, and but then it only referenced only referenced MBIS phase two MBIS. There were two things in that RFP. So in other words, the question he's asking was, the police department wasn't referenced in that RFP, and the other project that you referenced high school. Not, right. High school is not referenced in that RFP. So when I said either way, I was just speaking. Oh, you weren't two. Either, not future needs. No, no. no, you're talking about the auditorium MBIS. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry to clarify okay. that better. All right. That's, I think that's where the confusion is. Because when it talks about a, if an RFP is talking about a specific project and then references another specific project and then talks about future needs, then you would, when I said go either way, it could be that the project that it is specific to and the project that's referenced for a future need. Okay. But since the police department and the other project were not referenced, I would not. I would not make that recommendation at all. Okay. Right, because at that time that that was created, I remember now we were talking about both. They were both going to be done in the same right. summer, and then, and then, and then it got there was split. some further work that needed to be done, and we said, oh, "We want that in there, so we don't have to go rebid it again." I believe that's what was said, right? I, I, that's what I recall. 
So it's the future needs of that project. Yeah, of, of the MBIS. Because when you think about it from a practical standpoint, you might, let's say tomorrow, you know, you decide not to pursue some of the other capital projects you're contemplating. Well, you can't talk about a future need that isn't identified. So the future need that was identified was the MBIS. Okay. So uh, you know, at this point, um, again, the question I can bring is I can bring this item uh, back with the <laughs> final analysis, you know, the RFP uh, for discussion and action uh, for the meeting on the 16th, and whether the council wants to enter into negotiations uh, with Rose Construction for the um, MBIS project. Unless you, you uh, unless you want to make that, I'm not putting any pressure to make that decision tonight. That's why I offered the, the to prep it and bring it back for the 16th. Unless you feel comfortable making a decision tonight. But prep, prep what based on this? Well, I mean, yeah. There's there's not a whole lot. This this you this you set aside because I think I think the the language in, in nine takes precedent, and that's where if if you're comfortable with with that. Yeah. For the 16th? Yeah. For I the think so. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not starting. The so project can, hasn't even yeah. gone out to bid yet. So, so we can table it for now? Yeah. So we can, you can, we can come back for the, the 16th um, on there. You don't even have to table it. You could just keep it on. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's all. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I'll add that for the sure. 16th. Okay. Uh, next, we have a uh, discussion on contract review for North Brantford High School project. Yeah. So th this I added uh, in after uh, talking with with Tim uh, about uh, the assistance in terms of getting the permanent project building committee up and running. Uh, essentially, now that you've you've sent the high school project there, and the complexity of that project, um, and obviously the the. A lot of moving parts and working with the state. Uh, Tim had suggested that the uh, permanent project building committee, the town, could benefit from uh, an expert in the field by the name of Jeff D'Onofrio. And, and I know that Tim has had a lot more experience than I have. I know the name and I know the town has used them successfully. And he has quite the reputation within Connecticut um, as, as knowing this stuff inside and out. Uh, and the size and magnitude of, of you know, the, the high school, it might make sense on the front end, again, not to repeat and have problems like we did at MBIS. This would be something to raise for your discussion at this point in, in time uh, to see if it makes sense. So, so what, is, what exactly is this? It, it, well, so one of, one of the things that Mike and I discussed when we were going over these, these uh, contracts for the project given that this is a $66 million project, arguably this is probably one of the largest, if not the largest capital project ever undertaken uh, in North Brampton's history. And having gone through a $73 million like new renovation of a high school myself, uh, in a former life, I, I kind of appreciate the nuances and the complexities. And one of the things that I learned from that process is that not only are you required to um, review very um, specific and detailed and fact-intensive contracts, but you're also going to have the building committee deal with the Connecticut Department of Administrative Services, uh, specifically as it relates to school re uh, construction reimbursement. And it's a very nuanced process where the uh, town will have to submit what's called an EDO 49, going to have to detail certain fact-specific information to the state to guarantee that the town complies with reimbursement. Uh, it's a very specialized and skilled field, uh, and uh, Attorney D'Onofrio uh, has consulted municipalities across the state of Connecticut, specifically building committees, as it relates to reviewing your contracts to make sure they're iron tight, and number two, to make sure that your 
paperwork that is filed with the state proper, properly guarantees that whatever reimbursement you are entitled to under the formula that's determined by the state, that you dot your I's and cross your T's to make sure there's no problems on the back end. So I'll give you an example. Um, and back in 2008, uh, the town of Trumbull was in the middle of a $73 million high school renovation. They wanted to build a $7 million natatorium that would be standalone on the school property. At the time, we were told that the natatorium would service the entire community. So it would be used by seniors during the day for aquatics programming, and then in the evening it would be used by high school swim teams, uh, intramural swim teams, or private high schools that would want to use the facility. The problem with that was that, and, and this is where they didn't listen to Jeff's advice, is that when you seek state reimbursement, whatever you're seeking reimbursement to, it has to be correlated with the overall educational purpose of the expenditure. So in other words, if you're going to spend $7 million on building a pool, and it, you're going to say it's subject to state reimbursement, it's got to be correlated to the educational purpose subject to reimbursement. So in actuality, what we later found out was that the community would, if you were going to apply for reimbursement, the community would not be able to use the pool during the day because it wasn't correlated to education. So then the debate was, well, why are we spending $7 million on something that the community can't even use during the day? And then you had this. So it kind of goes back to one of the things that I said, I think, at a, at a previous meeting. When you start wrong, you end wrong. So where your numbers are coming in at real competitive rates on the front end, it's important to have somebody with construction, uh, legal construction experience to make sure that you do not get clobbered with change orders on the back end. You want to make sure that your contract's ironclad. And I should also note that this is common with construction projects of this magnitude where this is a construction-related cost that wouldn't necessarily come out of your operating, but would be built into your construction budget, which as I understand, the town has, in, in principle and in theory, approved that dollar amount as associated with your construction budget. Taking it a step further, and we've gotten into this with other items as of late, uh, we represent the town of North Brantford. We represent all of you. You hire us. If there becomes a situation where the PPBC is in conflict with the town council for whatever reason. During the course of construction, let's say there's a, a dispute over a contract, a construction amount, let's say down the road there's a problem on the back end with a contractor, to guarantee that there is segregation of duties and no conflicts, I would recommend that the PPBC should build into that budget a line item that covers legal associated with construction contracts, and also the application to the state for reimbursement. And that's here, and then we're here representing all of you. I just think it's, it's important to do this in a way that you get it right, right out of the gate, and if it's, and if it's not somebody like Attorney D'Onofrio, it, it is somebody in that field. You are dealing with a very significant, major capital project if these things aren't properly managed from the beginning, I've seen it, I've lived it, um, you pay for it dearly on the back end. So I just come with that recommendation. It's ultimately your decision. Mike and I discussed it, and I felt it important that we bring it to your attention. So the ED-049 is actually, so those that paperwork, my understanding, and based on other school projects that we've done, that is through the Board of Education, mm -hmm. correct? Right. Okay. And my understanding from the interview process that I've been on for the architect and the construction management company and everything else is that our architect, QAM, Rusty, has said that he is doing all of the paperwork for the state for reimbursement on there. Correct. So wouldn't this be covered under what Rusty is going to do from QAM? They prepare it. I guess what I'm getting at is you want to make sure that what's, you want to make sure that there's 
that you have internal controls in place that cross-check one another. In other words, Rusty, by the way, I've used that architectural firm as well. They're outstanding. They, uh, they designed our community center. They're very good. You just want to make sure you have different players lined up to cross-check others to make sure that while they're preparing the paperwork, we want to make sure that it, it is legally compliant with the statutory requirements that the state insists upon when you file it. Uh, we also want to make sure that somebody with a high level of construction litigation pedigree who's been involved in extensive construction litigation also looks at your contracts from the onset to make sure that, you, that there are no loopholes where you're going to get clobbered with change orders on the back end because I've seen that too. I've lived through that. That's not pleasant either. And I, and I know that this council is very sensitive to cost containment and cost control and, and consistent with what I believe to be your overall um, philosophy with taxpayer dollars. It's important to put those safeguards in up front to make sure the taxpayers don't get clobbered on the back end. What do you think the cost would be for us to have him for this project? What ballpark? On a $66 million project, it's hard for me to ballpark it. I, I would I would say that. Why don't we just have Michael look into it with, yeah, would uh, and would then it come back with a report? Yes. Yeah. Uh, because I would like to hear from Rusty because it's yeah. very conflicting, all of the reports that we have gotten. And, and I don't remember when we built Jerome Harrison or the auditorium. Um, I wasn't on the council for NBIS. Having something like this and, and you know, the architect is the one in the Board of Ed, is the one that submitted all of the documents to the state for reimbursement and things. And I don't know, I mean, this has not been budgeted in the, pro in the project as far as I know um, and stuff. And is it a reimbursable expense yes. to have that? I, I don't know. I mean, so I think we just need to get more information sure. and to talk to Rusty. Yeah. And Would it be on an as-needed basis? Yes. Yeah. That's what I would ask. There's no fixed. Yeah, so it would be a, an extension. Of, I mean, if the Permanent Project Building Committee has a, a value add to them in terms of on an as needed basis to review, mainly up front, from what I understand, up front. Um, but I think certainly we have Rusty here, uh, and, and I think he could weigh in. But I, I'm certainly happy to, to gather more information. And, and, and when Tim and I discussed it, I thought, yeah, that might be the, a layer of, of again, a, getting it right from the get-go um, is what we want to do. Do you need to talk to him where he can get a, an idea of what he feels roughly it would cost sure. for the project? No, that hour. Yeah, some type of hour cap and some type of uh, fee cap. Does yeah. that also include the other schools that we, that I, I know that our town already has done a lot of work looking at other towns and their projects, and I'd be curious to know how many of them that we were looking at Michelle, you, you, you want to say something? Yes, hi. Uh, Attorney Zinofrio is, uh, as Tim said, highly regarded in the construction legal aspects. He's used, he has been used by multiple towns in the state of Connecticut. We used him here in the past for construction projects. He also teaches AIA contracts as a class. Uh, he's also presented to my purchasing association. So he's very well versed in construction. And as Tim said, he's highly regarded here in the state of Connecticut. And if you like, I can certainly put out to my purchasing members to see how many of them currently use them or have used them. Well, like I said, we have used them here at, uh, when we did MBIS. So uh, very knowledgeable. Thank you. Thanks. OK. Anybody else? Okay, we'll move into uh, community events and presentations. Nothing. I think I, I, I hold on. <laughs> Was there anything you wanted to, to plug for the record? Or? I. Well, I, I know there's nothing listed, but I think we, we don't want to lose an opportunity. Yeah. All right. Uh, so we have a 
few community events coming up. We have um, a bunny trail, bunny tail trail coming up, um, similar to what we did at Candy Cane Lane. Um, so it'll be a drive-through event at STW where families can come through. It's going to be March 27th from 10 to 11:30. Um, we're also doing a fundraiser, like Rose addressed, for the Poco Festival where we'll be raffling off the gift cards. Um, and just to clarify, those gift cards are being purchased from the businesses. So the raffle also supports the business because we are purchasing all of those gift cards. So we're not asking for donations. Country Paint and Hardware was kind enough to give us a donation, but we're not requesting it from the business. We're trying to make sure that we're supporting local as much as possible while raising money. So thank you. Yeah, you guys are doing a great job. I, I was looking in the Totucker Times last week, and I think it was last week, you have a whole bunch of things going on. That's yeah. at, at this this time with all this going on. That's that's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, we're really trying. Okay. Uh, next to citizen statements and petitions and correspondence. No. Nothing. Okay. Here we go. Let's go into uh, resignations and appointments. First, I have uh, the appointment of Robert Whit Whitworth to permanent Republican to the uh, permanent project building committee, term to expire 11-30-2025. Resume is attached. So, so moved. moved. Second. Either way. <laughs> Pick. All right, Rose and uh, Walter. Any discussion? Can I have a vote, Michelle? Sure. Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. Next is appointment of Bruce uh, Ferret. Ferrone. Ferrone. Uh, Republican to Parks and Recreation Commission. Term to expire 12 31 2021. Resume is attached. Second. Rose and, and Ron. Any discussion? Uh, vote, please, Michelle. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Next is appointment of Jeffrey uh, McMillan, a Republican, to Pension Committee to fill Carolyn Candelora's position, term to expire 12, 12 1 of 21. Uh, as requested by Board of Education, Board of Ed minutes are attached. So moved. Second. Was that Walt? Yeah. Walt and, uh, and Mike. Uh, any further discussion? Can I have a vote, Michelle? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Next, we have appointment of Jeffrey McMillan. Uh, Republican to Permanent Project Building Committee as requested by Board of Education. Board of Ed minutes attached. So moved. <coughs> Second. Ron and Walt. Uh, any discussion? Can I have a vote, please? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Next is appointment of Elizabeth Sienna. Uh, Republican to the Permanent Project Building Committee as required by Board of Education. The Board of Edu Education minutes are attached. So moved. Second. Ron and Mike. Any discussion? Can I have a vote, please? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Next is a uh, reappointment of Melissa uh, Pantolino. Republican to the Economic Development Commission, term to expire 12-31-2021 to replace Jan Finch. Uh, Melissa is currently an alternate on EDC and she will be filing, filling the vacancy of community uh, member at large with uh, commercial loan and marketing background. So moved. Second. Walt, Walt and Mike, uh, any discussion? Can I have a vote? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? 
Next is uh, reappointment of Ronald uh, Sienna, Republican, to the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission, term to expire 531-2023. So moved. Second. You're on mic. You're on mic. Uh, discussion? Uh, vote, please. All in favor. Aye. 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 Next is reappointment of Harry, Harry uh, Dukla. Duk Dulac. Dulac. Republican to the Planning and Zoning Commission, term to expire 531-2023. So moved. Second. Who was that, Tommy? That was me. Uh, Deputy Mayor Zampano and, and seconded by uh, Councilor Policia. Any further discussion? Can I have a vote, please? All in favor? Aye. 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 Next is reappointment of Steve Sca uh, Scavo, Republican, to the Planning and Zoning Commission as an alternate term to expire 5-30-2023. So moved. Second. Walt and Mike, uh, any further discussion? Can I have a vote? All in favor? Aye. Aye. And last is uh, reappointment of John Pollock. Republican Police Commission, term to expire 1231, 2023. I'll move that. Second. Uh, Mike and who? Me. Oh, uh, Tommy. Uh, discussion? A vote, please. All in favor. Aye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, next, we have unfinished business, discussion, and action. First is Rusty um, Malik. Update on North Brantford High School building project. Good evening. Hi, um, so we are, um, we finished schematic design a few weeks ago, and we're about 50% done with, uh, completed with the design development phase. The design development is, is the phase where we've got the concept together, we're really coming up with all the finishes, all the materials that are going to be used, building sections, uh, organizing it, and it's the estimate for the, the project uh, during the design development estimate is one of the most important estimates that we'll do because really the construction manager will begin to understand the entirety of the building. And then our next phase after that is construction documents, which is really then filling in all the information, the detailed information for the, the, cons the, the design development phase. So that's moving forward on schedule. We have, as I mentioned before, a meeting with the state for the 15th of April for the DDR review. Uh, it's one of the processes, and after that, we'll go back again for what's called the PCR review, uh, which is the construction document review before we can go out to bid. Um, the construction manager has met with us. Um, we have a, every Friday, we have a meeting with the entire team. John is on there. Um, and, and so we want to you know, have a discussion about everything that's going on, make sure uh, if there's any information that's lacking, he's, he's really valuable in terms of giving us some background information or even talking about systems that the building, you know, that they want to use in the building uh, to make sure it's, it's user friendly and, and how, how they would interact with it. So, uh, you know, the Gilbane was at that meeting. We invited them to the meeting. We actually have another meeting with them on Thursday uh, to go over the a strategy meeting for not only the schedule but also, you know, constructability reviews and reviewing a model because we are creating this building in, in a BIM model and we will imp we import it to them so they can also see it virtually. Uh, so that process has has begun and we will talk about it in more detail on Thursday so that they can get up to speed. I want them to get up to speed in the sense that uh, they, because they're sort of new to this pro the, the project itself, not the process itself, but the project, uh, and we want to give them as much information now, uh, because they have two weeks basically to get that DDR estimate put together, and that's, that's a critical estimate, and that's the estimate that'll go to the state, because at, at every phase we also provide an estimate to the state. Uh, so they'll be working with us and developing that estimate, developing the site logistics plans, um, you know, and the overall project schedule. Our survey is complete. The geotechnical borings and, and uh, 
Drilling is all complete, and now we're waiting on the reports. We've got some preliminary information, and it's positive, so that's that's good. We don't have to do any piles, and that's that's a, a really it's a cost saver for us. Um, the environmental review is ongoing. One of the questions that came up is trying to determine where the, the septic system, the old septic system is. And that's where John comes in really handy because he was able to sort of help guide us because there was not a lot of documentation to help, help us determine where exactly that system is. Um, hazmat work has started and they started actually Monday. I had a preliminary discussion with them based on some of their initial work. We're going to have another meeting with the hazmat consultant as well as the construction manager uh, later this, this week or early next week. Uh, just to determine the, the extent that we want them to, to move forward. Because uh, it's when they're doing their testing, uh, there's the substrate testing, which we talked about uh, at the last meeting. Um, and, you know, we'll, we want to be judicious about where they do it, because if, if the, the, the consistency of, of where they're, the type of materials that they're working with, and the age of the building is such that we can categorize them in a way that we can say, yes, this is similar to another area, then we don't have to test every space. You know, there are certain requirements, and we'll do the minimum requirements and then evaluate before we continue to uh, you know, do more testing. The advantage is that we spend less money, and you know, we save that money from, uh, and because ultimately, this building is going to be demolished. And so why spend a lot of money testing if we can you know, get the characteristics in, in a way that we, we're comfortable with what's, what's there. Um, we met with the United Illumination <coughs> for several reasons. One of them was to discuss where the transformers are, are going to go, the new transformers. There's always a question about new versus how do you deal with the new and an existing. <coughs> you know, the existing's inside the building. Um, some, sometimes utility companies are concerned because when the new, new transformer and the first phase is online, now you've got two transformers if there's a fire in the building, whether they go, how they shut off occurs. So all these discussions have taken place with them. <coughs> We've also had a discussion about the energy rebate. Uh, so there's four different programs that they, that they shared with us and our engineers are working with them. We do the modeling. The, the certain criteria that we have to meet. Once we've met that criteria, we'll get a, a, a letter from them saying, yes, we meet these criteria, then we have to actually a achieve those criteria. Uh, and once you achieve those criteria, then there's a, a rebate program. Uh, you know, that can be quite a few thousand dollars that the, will be uh, money coming back to the community. Um, so that, that program and that work is underway. We met with the, uh, we've also had a, a meeting on high performance, and high performance is one of the requirements of our project for the state. Uh, so that ties in with the, the commissioning agent that's going to, that's we received the proposals from today. Uh, at the next meeting, that commissioning agent hopefully will be on board with us, and we'll discuss all the systems in the building <laughs> to make sure we get to achieve the high performance levels. The good news is when you achieve high performance, it helps you in terms of achieving the energy rebate requirements of uh, UI. So it's, it's, a, it's something we have to do anyway, so why not do it and get, get the energy rebate? Uh, we met with the kitchen folks, and, and that's been good just to talk about how the, how the service will be provided to the building, where the connections are gonna be, what type of equipment will be used, so that information is ongoing. Uh, and then we're scheduling uh, meetings with the teachers for the, our next phase, which is this, uh, the design development phase. So that, that process will begin to happen probably in the next two weeks. Um, in terms of uh, consultants that we still will need to bring on board, uh, there's the third party structural review consultant so what happens is before the structure, you know, and when we finish the structural design, there's a, because of the threshold of this particular building, we have to have a third party independent review. We will have a, a third party code review. We will do, we will bring on material testing. So when the construction is underway, 
they test the soils, they test the concrete and all that. So that's fairly standard. All these things are budgeted for uh, in, our, in our overall project budget. So there's a line item for every one of these items. Um, and then, of course, the clerk of the works and uh, commissioning. Uh, we are also going to be setting up a security meeting uh, to review our security, safety and security measures. That's one of the requirements of the states. We have to fill out all these documents and when we go to the state, uh, that's one of the prerequisites to getting approval. So we will be setting that meeting up with the police, uh, police chief and other you know, fire chief and so on because it has to be a comprehensive group that works on, on that. And we meet together, we come up with the plan, we share our, our, our information with them. It's a, it's a private meeting because this is not something that we can have, you know, uh, have available to everybody, but the concept is discussed and we go through and identify all the measures that would be taken and then get their feedback as to what they would recommend if there's any changes, then we make those changes uh, and get the project uh, you know, moving in that direction. And I think that covers most of what I was going to Do you about. have the school security as part of that, you know, team, that security meeting? Is yes. The schools, because I know they have a head of security in that. Right, no, and they have to be. In fact, the superintendent is part of that discussion okay. because He's the one that has to sign off on all the letters that, that okay. need to go to the state as well. So yeah, everybody, I mean, I, I just take that for granted right. that they're, they're going to be okay. part of the group. And with that, I mean, I'm looking forward to the permanent building committee being on, you know, starting our meetings with them because, again, there's a lot of information that we've got to share, uh, a lot of things that they need to be involved in. Um, and. It's going to get pretty intense with approvals. You know, we're, we're going to be talking about finishes, materials, all that stuff. <coughs> we'll have boards and a lot of information and very little time. So the turnaround time will be very, you know, have to be very fast. It might even be that we'll show up with a lot of information at a meeting, make a presentation, and then they will in turn have to take a vote on it. Hopefully, I know that the, you know, the town's interested in something that's going to be durable. You're not interested in cutting corners and doing something cheap, mm -hmm. especially in the public spaces, and I wouldn't recommend anyway you know, to you to cut back on those. So we'll be discussing all the materials, surfaces, you know, what type of floor, flooring material, what type of walls. All of that discussion will take place with the committee as we move forward, uh, you know, in, including furniture and technology. Do you have any comments about the earlier discussion with Attorney Herbs in regards to? So I think it's very important to have the contract with the construction manager you know, looked at by somebody who's an expert in contracts. Um, there are a lot of things, and I like to weigh in on what the expectation is. For instance, you know, I want to be make sure that the constructability review is written into their contracts so that they are responsible, we're working as a team. Uh, and I don't want it to be said, well, we didn't know about this because I want it to be understood that they're experts in construction and they, uh, when they look at our drawings, should be commenting on our drawings to say, hey, we think you need to add some details here or we need something, you know, a, a little bit more, more explanation in this area. And so that we, we, as a team, come up with a solution that minimizes change orders. So there's the certain language that I like to see in contracts, and I think it's important to have. This is a construction manager at risk. So I know we're all going to be part of a, a team, but ultimately they're at risk. And so you know, you look at them. You know, there's the advisor role, and then there's the risk role. So they've got, uh, uh, you know, they are going to push back. They're going to be, you know, in many cases because there'll be uh, construction change orders, and when construction change orders come up, how do you how does that get approved? Which contingency that, does that money come out of? So those sort of things have to be addressed because there's a construction manager's change order contingency and then there's the owner's change order contingency. Construction managers all want the money to come out of the owner's contingency because they want to hold their money as much as possible, as long as possible. And I don't blame them, it's just, that's just the way it, it is. And then we have to understand when each type of change order is approved. Uh, under what circumstances is it an owner's item and when, when is it a construction manager's item? So 
I think it's super important to have that very detailed review. And by the way, we do have a line item for legal in our soft costs. Uh, it's more for contract review than anything else. It's not for ongoing review, although you know, communities, if there's legal issues come up, then, then of course there's, there's other ways of addressing that. Um, we certainly are very familiar with uh, filing change orders and paperwork for the state. The, the actual filing has to be through the Board of Ed because it's all electronic. I can't access it. What I do is just like with the, when we were filing the 049s, I we made a hard copy, I pretty much filled it in, and then it was a matter of data entry to get it back to the, to the state. And that's the way the change orders will be, and the construction managers will be very uh, critical in the filing of the change orders because they develop all that paperwork, we review it, and then it has to be filed uh, through to the state. So it's important to, to you know, have somebody, and we've got a firm that's very familiar with the, the whole state process, so that's, that's good as well. Uh, then, of course, towards the end, the, the closeout phase is also very important, and that's when a lot of documentation <laughs> will be going to the state, and it's important for us to develop it in a way that if we're consistent from the very beginning, then that filing, the closeout filing, is a fairly simple process. But if you don't, if you're not consistent, it can be a bear. And so that's something that's important for us. You know, we sit down with the construction manager, set up a process and say, this is how it's gonna get done. At the end of the day, the building committee and the board of ed can file that, <coughs> and it'll be relatively simple. Okay. Do you think it'd be a good thing to have somebody like that on the team doing this thing? So I haven't worked with an attorney on the team itself. Uh, it's been on an as-needed basis, but mainly to review contracts. Uh, but, you know, but, you know, so, but having that knowledge there, uh, the fact is you're hiring us and you're hiring uh, Gil Bain. Uh, both of us have done you know, like 30 years of schools, so I've done hundreds of schools all through the state. So I know the process is pretty well, but there are times when we might need some legal advice uh, in, the, in the overall process, and I think that that'll be good to, if there's somebody that's working with us when those situations come up. Um, I mean, it, you know, the reality is the construction manager at risk will be dealing with all the subcontracts. That's under them. So they're responsible for those individuals. Uh, you know, sometimes there may be a difference of opinion between the two of us, and maybe that's where, you know, the attorneys come in, into, into play. So, you know, hopefully that's, at a minimum, or not at all, but knowing that there's somebody there, that would always be good. Thank you. I hear your, your answer as telling us that filling that role is desirable from your point of view and from your perception of the team's point of view. I guess I'd like to take it one step further. Do you see filling that role as a necessity for your team's work? So as I, as I said, most of my projects, the attorneys are involved in the contracts up front. And that's where the responsibility stops. They're not on a committee or a part of a, a weekly, daily discussion. You know, that goes on. And the only time then, then they come, to, come into, into play is if, the, if a legal situation arises or if there's conflict and we've got to resolve it. Let's say, um, a subcontractor is going to default. Now that's under the construction manager at risk's responsibility because they are retaining those, those that subcontractor. Uh, but you know they may say, no, well there's extenuating circumstances, so we shouldn't be having to deal with that, or we shouldn't have that that expenditure shouldn't come out of our contingency, it should come out of the owner's contingency. For some, you know, I'm just throwing out some hypothetical situation. And in that case, the attorney would, you know, help for the attorney to weigh in on it if we feel that we're at odds with, with what the construction manager is saying. Um, it doesn't arise too often, I mean, but it does, those situations do arise. Um, so I wouldn't expect that attorney to be at the job meetings on every, every week or, you know, you know, maybe they come to a building committee, but usually it's when a, when a certain situation arises that we need their their help in that. That's how I would, uh, that I, that's how we've worked with that in the past. 
Okay. Because ultimately, you're you know it's an expense to the project, and that's why when I say I that's have a budget line item for legal, it's more for contracts and, and those sort of things. Just just to add to that, <clears throat> obviously you've done a lot of high schools. How many other towns have hired an attorney like that that you've worked with? As on a permanent basis for the project, um, I haven't I haven't had that situation. Okay. But on a you know, but for the contracts up front, whether it's a town attorney or it's attorney that the town hires to review all those contracts, that happens all the time. Okay. Christy, uh, are we current on all critical path elements? We are current in all critical path elements. And these other, you know, we can have a discussion. I was, I wanted to discuss these other consultants that we need to bring on board with the construction manager also. Uh, I mean, there may be, as you can tell, when, when it comes through us or through the construction manager, it, we kind of uh, are able to get things done a lot quicker. We don't have to go through a lot of these, uh, you know, it's, it's going after RFP, although we still solicit three to four bids. Uh, so sometimes that'll help us along. Uh, the types of uh, consultants that I identified are all needed during construction. Uh, and then of course the reviewers uh, for the third party review. Uh, those again, uh, I've usually you know, gone out and just got three or four proposals. There's not a lot of people that do that. Uh, there are some firms that do that. I typically go out to those folks and they, they give us proposals. We, share that with you and, and we'll go through that process. So the council can, can sort of weigh in on that or the committee, however that authority is, uh, to get those, that, those folks on board. Thanks, Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next is uh, POCO 2021 Fireworks Award to Atlas Fireworks. How's everyone doing? Good, how are you? Um, so, I apologize again that um, I was not here last time to answer your questions. Um, I did forward over the contracts. Um, what we did is we looked into getting them for the next three years to lock in the price. Um, when I talked to Atlas as far as the pricing went, because fireworks come from China and things have kind of been disrupted, they actually secured a bunch um, ahead of time. So they actually are able to have that supply right now, so we wanted to lock those rates in for the next few years. Um, all of the rates are, um, they would push out if we had to postpone this year, they would all push out. So it would be the next three years we would be guaranteed that $10,000 show with all the shops that they have on the proposed list that you guys saw last week. Um, so we, if we did push out this year, we would be good until 2024. Um, and we wouldn't have to give them a, de a deposit each year until February. So, do you guys have questions on that? The deposit is a year by year basis, I assume. Correct. So, we would have to give them $5,000 soon to lock in for this year, and then we would be able to. Um, postpone it up to only 15 days in advance of the festival, which obviously would make a decision far before that, so. And then the deposit would carry over to next year. Correct, and then we would be able to give them a deposit again the following two years at the same price. Okay. And the we've worked with Atlas in the past, and they're wonderful, um, so they always give us a good show. And the time, and I'm pretty sure it's in there, but I'm sorry. <laughs> Ron. Um, so the amount of time that the show is to go on for and the amount of shells and everything is the same for every year as well, right? Correct. So this year, um, we've talked about different areas people can view um, the fireworks from. So possibly from the field where the car show normally is. 
in order to do that, they would have to sub out some of the smaller shells because the size of the shell determines how high they go in the air. Um, so we looked at firing them higher, but as a non-fireworks person, apparently that's not how it works. So we just have to have bigger shells, um, which would mean we would have a few less fireworks, but bigger displays that could be seen from farther out if we need to make people farther away from each other. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bigger is better. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. Okay. I guess uh, anybody else? Thank you. No, thanks. I'll move that motion. Is there a motion? Page 93. Do we have to approve this? Do we have to yeah, because we t you, you table, so there still have to be a, a, yeah. an award for the uh, for Atlas. Oh, okay. I make a motion to um, approve. There is no attached motion for 2021 Poco Festival Agreement number. Well, there must have been an RFP or something that went out, right? But there's there's no notation on here as to what this was which RFP it was. Um, so I guess it's just to approve the agreement with Atlas Pyrovision Entertainment Group for the fireworks for the Puppo Fest. Second. The, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, motion was made by Councilor Angeloni, seconded by Deputy Mayor uh, Zampano. Any discussion? Yeah. Uh, so this says that it's only for 2021, but we talked about a three-year. Uh, yeah, there's um, two other contracts that were included um, in the draft box. Three total contracts, one plus uh, two others that I believe might have seen up in the draft box or something out. Uh, yeah, I, I, I I'm not sure. They, they are the, they're the same contract with different dates for the show. Uh, they just have the show dates updated for each year as well as um, they, they would need to in the original RFP, it was marked that they, that was one of the questions of the RFP, that they would retain their prices for two consecutive years okay. after that. So I guess it, it So we'll have to vote on them each, each year? Or we're going to vote on them all now? Um, I think I would recommend that we lock all of those prices in now because we don't know what would happen to the price of fireworks in the future. Mm -hmm. It's definitely not going to go down. Um, so, and we can always adjust if we happen to make a ton of money and need to go up to make a bigger show. Um, but it is we'll also based on it. them giving us a good performance. So. I guess I'm just confused as to why this, so this couldn't have been done in one contract. They, this is, no, they no. wrote it as three separate contracts. That's how she, she sent it to me because I believe of the different dates each year. So it's for 21, 22, 23, but what happens if one of those years gets pushed out? They all push. Okay. The roll so, so we're just approving for 20, 21, 22, and 23 and there's provisions in the contracts that move it if something happens. Mm -hmm. Correct. So yep. if this year gets canceled, it goes out three years beyond that. So, so we don't have to amend to say now we approve 24 because it automatically moves. Right. Correct. Okay. All right. So I'll amend the motion so that we're approving the contract with Atlas for 2021, 22, and 23. Second. Just the question has have all three contracts been reviewed by the town attorney's office, particularly the provision about rolling them over? Um, I can definitely send those over to them. So you haven't reviewed them? Okay, yeah. yeah. Then it's going to have to be subject to the town attorney's review and approval. Right. So that the, I thought we went through this already that before it gets on our agenda, it gets approved by the town attorney. Yeah, David, David did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So David approved it already, so it's yes. fine. Okay. All right. So the motion is to approve 
with Atlas for 2021, 22, and 23 for the Poco Fest fireworks. Second. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many times I get to that. <laughs> That's the third, I think. Uh, <laughs> motion is made by Councilor Angeloni, seconded by Deputy Mayor Zampano. Any further discussion? No. You have a vote, please, Michelle. All in favor? Aye. 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 <clears throat> okay. Next is a discussion and action on audit of purchasing of accounts and uh, slash procedures. Yeah, the actual, um, there were some, some edits and revisions that went separately in the, uh, in the drop box. So um, there is a, uh, you should all have access to the, the revised um, comments that went internally. And one other um, correction, um, I think Tim had, had, had taken out the, the uh, comparison, I forget where I had it, uh, excuse me over here, um, on um, page, uh, page 17 on the striking the uh, reference to the Connecticut Municipal Audit clients uh, comparing ourselves to other other communities and population of 20,000 uh, or more. Uh, I just wanted to edit that to say more comparable somewhere of those towns with populations of 10 to 20,000 versus anything over 20,000, just to, just to be closer in comparison because I think it's still an important point rather than strike all of it. Mike, who made the corrections and, and why were they made? Uh, I went internally with, uh, with Anthony and myself looking at this and uh, um, again, trying to soften it a bit in terms of uh, forensic to what the title is, audit of, of services for what you're looking for in terms of internal controls and reporting systems, not to flag any of the uh, bond agencies or rating agencies uh, with that. And then there were some other changes with respect to uh, uh, you know, instead of re reporting the uh, insurers to the finance director to the risk manager instead, uh, just some corrections of that nature. And who's, that, the, who's the risk manager? What's that? Yeah, Michelle. Okay, Michelle. Yeah. Is, is that common to change the, the title of it? I don't think so. It's not what we asked for. Well, it's any title you want to put on it. Tim, no, I'm, I'm asking though. Is that is that is that common? I, is that customary to change the title of that because of what you just said? I, I'm I'm asking because I do not I do not know the answer to that. So you're specifically asking about the striking of the of the words of instance. the term, right? I just I'm just I just want to know for our benefit. I mean that's a valid point. If it if it is going to affect bond ratings and stuff yeah. like that, yeah, it's a valid point. The difference between forensic versus just Right. So, um, and we kind of touched on this at one of the previous meetings that both David and I were at via Zoom. A forensic audit, and I'm going to give you a lay definition, as I understand it, having been through two of them. A forensic audit tends to be a deep dive, if you will, where they, uh, where an auditor or a group of auditors will uh, go in and, and really surgically examine uh, accounts, account practices, account procedures, and determine if there is anything amiss. Uh, a general audit uh, really does a overview of um, systems, uh, operations, uh, internal controls. Uh, it will usually, um, a, a general audit will look at historical data. So. You can't really take a snapshot of one year in time. They'll look at you know, maybe a period of three years or five years to see trends. And, and an audit will generally make a series of recommendations uh, to the organization as to what's going right, what could be improved, and then they'll give recommendations as to how to improve it. My experience with forensic audits has been on construction projects. So, in that instance, you're dealing with a fixed amount of money, or you might be dealing with cost overruns. You want to know what caused the cost overruns. So that's when you would do the deep dive, go into, 
the project on a line by line basis, compare it to the original project budget, and then really pinpoint where there were irregularities. So with your municipal budget, um, you know, you have, you have external audits every year. I'm standing away from this because it's a little bit of an echo. Uh, but you have external audits every every year where external auditors come in, they look at your fund balance, they look at your operating budget, they look at your accounts, perhaps over a three month, six month, eight month, 12 month period, uh, and then they make a report uh, to your finance director, in this case your treasurer, uh, and those external audits are provided to rating agencies for the purposes of determining the credit profile and the credit worthiness of the community. So, that, you know, off the cuff is, is how I would distinguish the two. Uh, a forensic audit is very specific. It's a deep dive. It's, it's seeking to look for specific information if there is a concern about irregularity. And a general operational audit takes an examination of system processes and determines if there are uh, areas for improvement, strengths, and how the improvements or weaknesses can be corrected or achieved. Okay, but now my question is, because I remember you you did explain that, and you and Dave did on the last order. Uh, is this something we need to do in, in a sense that we have to change the 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 title of it or the the name of it? Do we are, to remove the word forensic? Is is that is that? put a negative into in, somehow a negative view on the town of North Brantford if we're having a forensic order. I, I guess is really my question. Let me just add one thing before you answer that. I guess we have conflicting views right now. I think in the first presentation, you had noted that it was actually a positive thing because uh, bonding agencies would see that we're looking into ourselves, we're gonna make sure we're doing stuff the right way. Either you said that to him or somebody did. And now we're hearing that forensic might be a negative and may hurt us, so I'm kind of confused. Sure, well, I think I said in a general sense, okay. auditing is a good thing. Okay. Because an organization that is conducting a self-assessment, good, bad, or indifferent, if that's a noble goal. If, if, if you're trying to determine how I can make something or how you as a body can make something better, that's laudable. You know, because if you're going to act on recommendations and make something better, I think rating agencies would applaud you for that. You know, we did a audit of our pension system. It was funded at 27%. They gave us recommendations. We implemented the recommendations. They upgraded our credit rating. So audits are generally a good thing. I think what the town manager is saying, and, and Frank and Treasure, I don't want to put words in his mouth, is that because it is using the word forensic with respect to system operations and internal controls, would that raise a concern, or could it potentially raise a concern with the rating agency? So I just want to distinguish that. I hope I clarified that point. So do you think it could potentially raise like a red flag or something? That, that is not for me to opine upon. You know, I, I have to be careful here. You know, um, your, t your town attorney is, is not an advocate, it's, in, it's an advisor. And I, I would advise you that um, whatever you choose to, to publish, uh, we will draft it uh, or redraft it or edit it in a way that carefully weighs and considers the concerns that have been raised, but also gets you to a place where you're comfortable in terms of uh, seeking responses to the, to the RFP and, and, and ultimately deciding to either proceed or not proceed with the body. When we voted last month, we didn't vote for forensics, so we have to change our vote. So, so we made a red line revision based upon manual edits that we received from town staff. That's why we've made it as a track change so you can see what we changed. As I said, it's not our decision, it's your decision. Uh, we provide advice, you, you set public policy. So we will do whatever all of you ask us to draft it to do. The only, uh, I guess as a council, we can talk about the naming. I, you know, there's something with all the bonding that we're gonna do and it's something to definitely take into consideration. But the one thing that I, I do want to uh, um, 
say that I'm not in favor of is the time frame, reducing it from 10 years down to two or three years. I think, you know, a five year time span, five to seven, something like that would be much more reasonable. Um, so that's the only thing I'm not in favor one of. The, one of the reasons that triggered that change is because um, you might not have records that go back 10 years. So the Connecticut State Library produces what's called an M1 schedule as it relates to document retention. And there are time frames for certain document retention. So some documents have to be retained indefinitely. Some documents are retained for 10 years. Some documents are retained for five years. Some documents are retained for three years. Believe it or not, some documents don't have any retention requirements. They can be disposed of them immediately. So I think that one of the comments from staff, which is a valid point, and you have to figure out how you want to navigate it, is that you might be seeking a review of records that no longer exist, because they might have been disposed of under the state document retention records policy. They could, they could exist, I'm just, but I'm just saying they might not, uh, through no fault of anyone here. It's just what the law says you keep and what you don't keep. And what's the impact of the changing the comparison to the towns of X size range versus another? Does that compromise I, I it think, in any way? I think what, what that was just noted because we're not at 20,000 residents yet. And, right. and I saw the line go through it, so I thought it was to straight yeah. it out. But I, I think Mike raises a very good point to put from the 10 to the 20 range because that would cover your population here as for comparative purposes. It can be, yeah. I just, I think that rather than striking it all, just, and. Okay. But we will do whatever you want us to do. It's your decision. We have, we have a general audit in here, and I don't know, I can't see going for another general audit if we already have one from the independent auditor's report. I think we need more to look at our policies, procedures, what we do, and how we do it. And I think that's more of a forensic type audit than so a general audit. Is that audit that you're referring to the same? Is that recommending operational changes and internal looking at internal controls? Or yeah. is that? So one we get every year, basically. It's just a general view, a little snapshot of what we do. And I can't see spending money on another little snapshot of what we do. I want to see how we do it, and what's right and what's wrong. I don't know. Is this, is, are you referring to this, the annual financial report? Yeah. That's more reconciling the numbers, right? It looks like a capper sort of thing that's showing you. Well, it's got, the, it's got the independent auditor's report in it from um, the people we pay, A A O right. and company. They'll give, what, what generally they do is they give a, a, an executive summary mm -hmm. of their assessment, and then as you go through it, they, they do an analysis of your fund balance, reserves. More of a financial analysis versus an operational They look analysis. at your long-term debt. Yeah, so it's not an operational they look analysis. At four, yeah, they look at a, a forecast exactly. of your bond indebtedness. They look at your revenues, <clears throat> where your revenues come from beyond property taxation, what other cost centers they come from. They break down your yeah. Expenses by cost center. That's what I thought. So a general audit that you were referring to, though, is not that, right? It's more of a. You said it looks at your internal controls and your. Well, if you if you read this and yeah. you get this every year, yeah. and I've read a few of these for your town and for others, they don't do a deep dive That's into okay. operational. So it is different metrics. Yeah. And whether you call and by the way, Ryan, whether you call it a forensic audit or not. If you look at the actual language and what you're asking them to do, you're asking them to look at internal controls and, and your internal systems. Yeah. So you can call it, you know, um, forensic, not forensic. You could call it uh, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the, the narrative is what is yeah. going to determine the response you get. I think as long as the narrative is, is the same and what we're, what we're seeking, um, and if we can take forensic out and that doesn't raise any red flags, that's good for all the bonding that we're going to do. And, you know, as long as we can still. Um, Are you guys double A too? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. 
So, I mean, that's a, that's a good credit rating, and you're obviously about to bond, you know, $66 million, so you want to make sure you keep it there, and, you know, one day maybe hit that AAA. I know we tried, we didn't get there. We tried. It's tough. It's tough. I would think that we should take a little time to review. I agree. Um, to make sure we know what we what we want, or what we're you know what we as a group want want to want to uh, audit. That, that's my opinion. I agree. Because I think we also have to, and I've said it before, we have to make sure whatever we do audit when we see improvements or or, or opportunities for improvement that we act on them and we just don't take this, because this document, you know, usually gets put away. Because if I recall, other other audits had uh, opportunities in there. I, I mean, I just received this one tonight, so I don't have any idea what's, what's in it or not in it, but it's, um, it's a terrible thing to just do an audit, spend, spend, spend uh, taxpayer dollars, and not, not utilize it. So to answer your question, Deputy Mayor Zantano, um, you really want to focus on not so much the title of the audit, but what you're requesting right. the prospective bidder <coughs> to be responsive. Correct. With. Yeah, and, I, and I, totally, I, I totally understand That's that. That's But I was just wondering, you know, when I see the title change, that just, you know, poses a question, so then you, you, you carefully answered that. But, uh, but now that I just, I think we should all be clear on what what uh, what we're trying to achieve out of an audit um, you know so we're looking for looking at the right right um, procedures or policies or, or activity to make sure that we're spending money properly so maybe we table it everybody takes a look at the RFP again to make sure that any concerns that we may have had are addressed in it and maybe we need time to review this because we haven't had time to Right. Is yeah, I, I would be careful with that because this is a this is like the capper. This is like yeah, that's not like like that's, 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 that's apples to oranges yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. I, did, uh, your I, I really don't think there's a hell of a lot to be gained by angsting over the caption being forensic or deleting that phrase. Any rating agency that's worth its salt is going to look very carefully at what we're doing every audit that we've ever had, you know, not too distant past, and they're gonna come up with their rating. They're not gonna base it on the title of the document or the RFP that we put out. Right. Just my opinion. I don't pretend to have any expertise in this area, but I can't believe they're that naive. Yeah, I, I agree, I agree, but I just, what I'm saying is we just need to, I, I think we need a little, little time to think about it and understand what that's fine. What the what the what the audit is we're trying to to put forth, if that's what we want or not want. I agree. <clears throat> the table with the clarifier. Right? Cool. So I think that if you have additional edits or suggestions, I think the best way to process that is they should all go through Mike. Yep. And then Mike quarterbacks so the recommendations and then. We'll communicate with his office to determine next steps. Yep. Thank you. So we Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Do we need a motion to table that? Well, it's under unfinished business. It'll just stay under yeah. unfinished yeah. Okay. business. Okay. All right. Very good. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Okay. Next is uh, new business discussion and action. The first is Resolution for North Brantford Pollinator Protection. Yeah, this was the uh, resolution draft I showed uh, at the last meeting, and, and uh, um, I did not receive any, any comments or, or suggested changes, so it's brought back to you for your approval. Uh, it's a non-binding resolution, but uh, helps with our sustainability. I'll make a motion to move the resolution for the North Ramford Pollinator Protection. I'll second that. 
Okay, the motion was made by Councilor Angeloni, seconded by Councilor Diamond. Uh, any further discussion on this? Can I have a vote, Michelle? Well, Aye. 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 <coughs> Next is uh, reward of bid number seven, 2020-2021 concrete work for pavilions at North Farms and Northford Parks. Right, so you have the uh, memo from uh, Jesse and the uh, concurrent uh, rec commission on the award for uh, Sorelli uh, uh, for the for the concrete. I think by, by pronouncing it right, Sorelli construction for the concrete work. Oh. I'd like they are bitter. Yeah, I'm sorry, bitter. Go ahead. I'd like to make a motion to award bid number seven. 2020-21 concrete work for pavilions at North Farms Park in Northford Park to Sorelli Construction out of North Haven at a estimated price of thirty thousand dollars, thirty thousand four hundred dollars. I'll second that. Okay. The motion was made by Councilor Angeloni, seconded by Councilor Gold. Uh, any further discussion? No. Can I have a vote, Michelle? All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, next we have a request for, for, to add a part-time custodian for Parks and Recreation <coughs> Department. Yeah, and this is in here because essentially it's, it's, it's a part-time position that, that they'd like it, so it's a, it's a new position, if you will, because they, uh, they need someone to cover the evening and, and weekend hours. And so with technically still a hiring freeze in place, uh, these items have to come before the council for your blessing uh, before we go forward. And Jesse is here to answer any questions you may have. One question that came up is, is, is this COVID related or is this a position that you're looking to, to make permanent even after COVID? We'd like to make it permanent after COVID. Um, moving forward, just to keep the facility clean, it should be implemented. Um, right now, we only have daytime cleaning, even though our programs run late into the evening, and no weekend cleaning. So if we're operating on the weekends, there should be staff there to clean. So it would be something we'd like to continue and have put it in the budget for next year, um, but would like to op uh, implement it prior to, so. Is, is this position needed as part of your reopening yes. plan. Yes. And that's kind of dictated by East Shore Health as far as what has to be done to reopen? To reopen the fitness room, yes. Absolutely. How many hours will be given? Not to exceed 19. Mm -hmm. So it would be a part-time position with no benefits. And there's existing money in the account, so there's Correct. Out of the current budget, so there's no... Out of the current budget, out of the current part-time wages, so there would be no additional expenses. We're not expecting an overture in that account. It's just a new position. Right. Okay. Okay. So I'd like to make a motion to approve the hire of a part-time custodian position for the um, Parks, Recreation, and Senior Center. Second. A uh, motion was made by Councilor Angeloni, seconded by Councilor Felicia. Uh, any further discussion? Can I have a vote, Michelle? All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, next we have uh, Stanley T. Williams uh, roof. I guess, Rose, you want to talk about that? Oh, you got item D. No. What about D? Building D. Committee. Oh, I'm Police. sorry. Uh, all right, next is uh, Building Committee. For new police facility. I, I had asked for the county agenda because they had come up with a PD committee. Um, they wanted to be building in, but I understand that <coughs> probably the prevailing view is to turn this over to the permanent project building committee. Well, I, I think um, based on the conversation that we had in what the attorney told us when we were voting for the high school, is because one of the requirements for the state was that. There, we, have, we had to appoint a building committee, so that's when we asked, could the town council be the building committee, or did it have to go to permanent project building committee, which was not full at the time. We had a lot of vacancies on that. And what we were told from the town attorney is basically, it's either the town council or the permanent project building committee, one of the two. Um, so 
my personal feeling is now that the permanent project building committee is full and we've filled all the spots on there, I, I think this building project should go to the permanent project building committee. Um, that's the way the ordinance, you know, the boards and commissions that were set up by ordinance, that was the purpose of it. So I only brought it up because it had been voted on by that committee. They wanted to be the building committee, but obviously it's not the prevailing view. Um, and in terms of the final project building committee, I will bring forward a name because we have to uh, reappoint an alternate to the permanent project building committee. Well, there's two on there right now. There, yes, but one of these terms expired. We will bring it forward the next one. Oh, okay. No, okay, so no action or anything? No, so, so no. Uh, may I, uh, I think it would be in order uh, for the next meeting on the 16th to prepare a motion, a resolution to move the, the police department project building, to yeah. the permanent project building committee. It's fine. Okay. Okay. Next uh, is it, uh, Stanley T. Williams, uh, Roof Rose. You wanna? Um, yes. So um, as liaison to Park and Rec, um, I was included on an email that Jesse had. Um, they had some substantial leaks um, in the building um, last week, and she had sent some pictures to Mike and and things. Um, and Franny has since um, sent his guy up there, plus Franny was up on the roof um, to look at what the condition of that roof is. As you know, that roof, replacing that roof has been on our CIP list for the last number of years, um, and we've been just doing some repairs to kind of get us through, but um, I'd like to have Franny just kind of report to us what he found when he went up there. and what his recommendation is. Uh, yeah, so uh, the, we, uh, we went up on the roof. So the leaks that were happening last week had a lot to do with the snow that was up there to warm and all the rain we got. So what happens is the snow is up there, it turns slushy underneath, and the water has no place to go but down. So the roof is in bad shape. It's, it's cracked all over. I mean, you can't, you're not gonna repair it. <laughs> you, you just put a little emphasis on that. Magnet. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the roof is in bad shape. I mean, the, um, it's cracked all over. Uh, personally, I wouldn't repair it right now. We did get a price on uh, doing some uh, repair work by the hour. It's you can't see where it's leaking. You you would spend hours looking around. Other than the fact the whole thing's cracked. It's like a rolled roofing type roof. Uh, we're going to be keeping the building, I'm assuming. So if we are doing that, anything to the roof. There is a part of the roof that's wood, and if it continues to go like that, we're going to be ripping that deck off. Uh, the only unknown is asbestos. There hasn't been any tests done on it. Uh, there are some quotes floating around there, but I would think, you know, just as a number, anywhere from 800 to probably 1.2, million. I mean, the other quotes were, uh, uh, what, what year was the quote? Yeah. So, 2018 was one, and then we just got one recently um, for 895 But that was with the question mark on the asbestos. So part of the roof has got a steel deck. The other part has got, for whatever reason, it has a wood deck on top. So <clears throat> right now it looks like it's all right. But if we keep going the way we are, um, we're going to be doing a lot more work to it. And so on top of that, so once I found out about it, I did contact our state rep, Vinny Candelora, and asked him about um, if there was any possibility for state reimbursement because there are still school programs in that building. Um, and he is confident that he can get State, some state funding for us on the roof replacement um, and be able, his idea is that he 
would like us to do this sooner rather than later to get it through and he will work with the state um, as far as because of our other bonding programs that we're working with right now um, so that was his recommendation that if we are going to go forward with it now is the time to do it and he's confident that he can get us some state reimbursement on the roof so so my question to Anthony is because this is not in our CIP budget right now and if we were to go forward with it and want it to get it I mean you know chances are it won't happen until summertime by the time we went through everything that we had to go through can we wait until the budget season and put it in for the 21-22? Yes. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense, yeah. We're going to be bonding short-term money probably in April uh, to kind of cut us over until November. So it won't make the April pass, obviously, but for the November bond sale, we can definitely include it in, in that money that we'll need at that point. Put it in the budget and then we'll just pick it up when we do have a bond in November. Because you're talking, even if it's a uh, million dollars, you're talking half a million, six hundred thousand out of pocket. So we have to bond that probably. Okay. So, um, I and mean, we can put it on the agenda for the next council meeting. Um, and because if we decide that this is what we're going to do, we will have to have the board of ed approve the project first as a school project you know to go through the steps of the state to get to file for reimbursement and everything else um, so that's where we're at on that roof so. Okay. Uh, citizen statements and petitions are next. This is a one kind of going back to the Board of Ed and yeah. the EDO 49s. The EDO 49s, the Board of Ed files, which is the budget document, but the EDO 46s, which is actually the required test for money, uh, we do here. Those are filed by us. We do all the financial records and we file the EDO 46s. Okay. with the state and one more question on, on your on your talk about the word forensic or not if you get your iPads in front of you go to Google and type in forensic audit and see what pops up I think it has a big okay. change thanks Anthony yes I don't know if this is the appropriate time or location but uh, I'm Bob Whitworth you've heard of me you just voted for me. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to thank you on this broad with some manners, so I want to say thank you to each of you for your support and your endorsements. Uh, you've seen my resume. Uh, that's only a little piece of me. Uh, I, here, I'll spend 15 seconds, and here's the rest. Uh, as a young kid, 11, 12, 13 years old, I basically lived on construction sites in Maryland, Connecticut. They built Interstate 691 through the town, here in the mall, here in the square. I had my own car gas. I had my construction boots, and I was never kicked off the construction site. And I've always had that bug with me, but a little thing got in the way, it's called a career. So I was an air traffic controller for 40 years, and I'm still in the business, I'm just not talking airplanes. And uh, I've been waiting 40 years or more for this opportunity, and I'm very humbled by it. So I, uh, I hope not to disappoint, I'm a hard worker. I'd like to think I'm a, a decent fellow, and I just want to say thank you. Can't wait to get going. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. I was wondering who you were. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you. Okay. Anything else, Michael? No, I have nothing by uh, email. No? Wow. Anthony? No, negative. No comments. Wow. Okay. Uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming. Michelle, thank you for the... For the uh,